Hey everyone, I am Howard Beck, and I will be your host for the next four episodes of this podcast as we delve into basketball analytics, the whys and hows, the do's and the don'ts, with a series of experts who, frankly, know way more than I do on the subject. I guarantee you I will be learning as much as you will be, and frankly, that was part of my goal in devising this series. You see, I've been covering the NBA as a journalist for 26 years, and a lot has changed in that time. The way the game is played, the way it's covered, the way we analyze it and discuss it. And when it comes to statistics, that discussion has changed dramatically, even just over the last five to 10 years. The tools we use, the terminology, the vast amount of data that's available now. Our conversations about the game are smarter now because of it all, but well, it can be enough to make your head spin, too. Uh, I've done my best as a reporter to learn as much as I can, but I still get tripped up at times. And I've often thought, why isn't there a course we can all take, fans and media alike, to learn how to best use all these new stats? My friends at the Sports Business Classroom agreed, and so here we are. A four-part series to make us all a little smarter with guidance from some of the sharpest people working in basketball analytics. We're kicking it off with Kevin Pelton, who has been writing about the NBA with a focus on analytics for ESPN since 2013. Prior to that, KP was with BasketballProspectus.com, one of the earliest basketball analytics sites. He was a statistical consultant to the Indiana Pacers for two years, 2010 to 2012. He also wrote for Supersonics.com for four seasons. So Kevin is not only an expert on stats and basketball analysis, but he's been writing about the game and distilling all those concepts for fans and readers for a long time, and no one does it better. In this first episode, Kevin Pelton and I will dive into some of the basics of basketball analytics, why we focus on pace and per possession stats instead of per game numbers. We'll learn about the four factors and their importance in understanding the game and efficiency, how we define it, why it matters. Okay, let's get into it. I'm here with Kevin Pelton. So, Kevin, as you know, uh, our goal in this series is to give NBA fans and even my fellow NBA media members a sort of a basic guide to analytics usage, best practices, how to sort the, the good stats from the bad, how to use stats properly, frankly, because I'm not sure we're all doing that uh, well all the time. Um, and as you've helpfully reminded me, all the let's say new stats, I'll say new because I've been doing this a long time, the newer stats we lean on the way that we measure production and efficiency, it's based on kind of a fundamental shift in how we discuss the NBA and the game. Um, for most of NBA history, we talked about everything on a per game basis. Uh, many of us of a certain age grew up on points per game, assists per game, rebounds per game, and that was it. And then we dumbly ranked team offense by points per game for, points per game against. We know better now. That all seems almost comically simplistic looking back and inaccurate. Um, because we didn't account for pace. We didn't account for possessions. So let's start there. The building blocks, the basics of how we should talk about the game and, and, and the kinds of stats that that uh, necessarily leads to. So how did we make this shift as a basketball community from per game statistics to per possession? And, and why is that so important? Yeah, I think it like everything else in basketball statistics dates back to baseball because of the fact that they were at the forefront of the statistical movement in sports. And, you know, one of the great insights that Bill James and the other pioneering sabermetricians provided is like the scarce resource. They did the same thing in baseball. They ranked teams by, I think, batting average instead of runs, if I recall correctly. Like if you, if you looked in the agate in the uh, Sunday paper back in the day, and it's like, well, obviously the goal of the team is not to get it hits, the goal is to score runs. And, you know, so from that standpoint, points per game was actually a little closer than that. But, you know, in baseball, outs were the scouts rates, scarce resources. In, in football, it's plays because you have to keep grinding towards another first down. And in basketball, it's the possession because in every game, depending how you define it, but how we have come to define it is the possession is basically continuous possession until the other team takes over. So an offensive rebound is still part of the same possession. Uh, each team is going to have basically the same number of possessions in a game. You can have a slight offset if a team takes the last shot of every quarter. Uh, they could have you know a couple more in a game. But basically, you're going to have the same number of possessions, and you've got to be more efficient within those possessions than your opponent is. And that gets credited. It's interesting because the possession concept really dates back a long time. Dean Smith 
used it at North Carolina throughout his coaching career. And a number of his disciples, you know, took that since obviously the Dean Smith coaching tree was immense. Roy Williams was a big user. And I remember talking to Nick Collison about his experience, hearing about per possession stats when he was playing for Roy Williams at Kansas. Uh, but in terms of using it statistically, it was really Dean Oliver who kind of introduced this to everyone when he started writing about basketball in the 80s and 90s. And it, it took a while to catch on until the early 2000s, but that was the building block. If Dean Smith was tuned into the idea that possessions were what mattered most and count on like a really smart basketball coach to kind of intuitively understand this in a way that maybe the fans and media did not. But why why then, and especially given his large coaching tree, did it take so long to kind of permeate the rest of 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 basketball to permeate the mainstream? Why did it take all the way until the 80s or, or later for a, you know, a Dean Oliver to put this uh, on paper that was literally basketball on paper is the, <laughs> yes. is the, the title of the book, right? Um, it's, it's, what, it's somewhere there in the bookcase behind me. Yes. Uh, I, I can't quite make them all out, um, <laughs> but I'm, I know it's there. So how did it take, why did it take so long? Well, part of it, I, and I think this, you know, has to do with the timing of the statistical revolution in baseball is kind of the advent of computing and the power to take advantage of this, some of this data, because like, you know, I was just, just searching for this on Google before we started recording, like Roy Williams was literally tracking the possessions by hand when he was a student assistant in North Carolina. So it wasn't like, you know, I mean, if you were a beat writer, potentially you could have, I guess, tracked that along with the score, but it would have been a lot of extra work. And, you know, if you were just a fan, certainly talking about the game, you weren't going to know how many possessions your team had. We've always had a sense for like, you know, the Denver Nuggets under Doug Moe played a really fast pace or things like that. But it just became a lot easier to quantify, especially now, you know, starting in 1996 is the beginning of the play by play era uh, in basketball. Beginning of literally when we tracked the play by play. I mean, I think it got printed out and distributed to reporters yeah. before 1996, but like having yeah. an actual archive of it, that's the cutoff. Right. Because other, otherwise you can't quantify it. You can't categorize it. You can't sort it. Right. Um, so the game is ultimately in the game of basketball, like most games, there's offense and defense. Right. We break it into these these two basic components. You either have the ball or you're uh, defending against the team with the ball. Um, so the basic question, how do we best assess team offense, team defense? Um, is it just about points scored, points allowed? Is it. Uh, points that scored or allowed per possession. Is that enough to, to fill in the, the information? Um, is it field goal percentage for and against? Like, what are the components when we start to break this down into how to quantify and rank team offense and team defense? Where does that discussion lead now? What is the, the, the smartest way of kind of breaking that down? Yeah, points per possession is the ultimate goal, really. Like I said, you're going to have more or less the same number of possessions. Uh, people will talk about playing the possession game in terms of getting you know, offensive rebounds, forcing turnovers so you get more shot attempts than the other team. But you know, that's, that's kind of, in statistical terms, a different concept. Uh, something we often quantify is shot volume. Uh, my, my colleague John Gassaway talks about that a lot at the college level, where it's maybe even more important than it is in the NBA. But you know, it really is the point scored and points allowed per possession. And a team that was very influential in kind of spreading this thinking was the, the seven seconds or less, Mike D'Antoni, Steve Nash, Mario Stoudemire, Sean Marion Sons, because, you know, they played, again, even everyone that didn't look specifically at their possessions per game realized that they played in an extraordinarily fast pace relative to the rest of the league. So if you just rated their defense in terms of points allowed per game, they were going to look terrible. Uh, if you looked on a per possession basis, they were not necessarily great still, but they were closer to average some of those years and especially the years that they did particularly well. Uh, and then even once you accounted for their pace, still Steve Nash's teams, I believe, led the league in offensive rating basically every year from 2003 three to 2009, some, some stretch like that, basically, even going back to when he was in Dallas. Wow. That's incredible. And it is really remarkable, Kevin. And, and I listen as a member of the NBA media who wrote about, discussed, and, uh, you know, was just wowed by those Phoenix Suns teams of Mike D'Antoni and Steve Nash. I remember very vividly that while we were all praising them and enjoyed watching them, the critique was, well, they don't play any defense. And it was because everybody at that time, and this doesn't feel like that long ago, but in the, in the mid to late 2000s, People were still looking strictly at 
Well, they're allowing a lot of points per game. They're last in the league, probably, I'm going off of memory here, in points per game allowed. So they're terrible defensively. But you just noted, and I don't think we knew this until a couple of years later when, whether it was basketballreference.com or uh, I think there was hoopdata.com, some of those other early sites, you could finally rank based on a possession basis uh, and, and, and involve pace in the stats and see that, oh, no, no, as you just said, they were actually kind of middle of the pack. So uh, the recontextualizing or the smarter understanding of what teams are doing has allowed us to appreciate a team like the Suns, I feel like, in a, in a different way. Are there other examples of that over the years, whether it's offensively, defensively, or otherwise, where it retroactively, now we, when we boil things down to per possession, we go, you know what? We had it wrong in real time. You know, I don't think people quite appreciated how good the Jerry Sloan Jazz were offensively. This is something, something that I think Dean Oliver wrote about in Basketball and Paper is that basically is as soon as he took over from uh, Frank Layden, I believe was his predecessor as coach. And like Mark Eaton had been the center in the, the Layden era and they were really good defensively. Uh, but then they became much better offensively under Sloan. And like everyone knew about their pick and roll and, and you know, the Stockton Malone pick and roll and everything that they did with that. But because of the fact that that was a very slow paced offense, like the pick and roll was usually kind of what they did after playing 15 seconds of a motion offense. Uh, I don't know if people appreciated in the, in real time, quite how good those teams were on offense. Hmm. Um, and I think maybe at least with the Suns, we now discuss them, I think in a little bit more intelligent way. I don't think we have too many people still clinging to the idea that they were absolutely horrific defensively i think there's a different kind of appreciation for them looking back I, I could be wrong but it is it is striking how differently we now um talk about and understand the game be because of this and because we now have the stats available to us and of course nba.com itself their stats site provides all of that data as well and everything on a possession basis it's it's um it is a completely different way of looking at it than it was when i first started covering the nba in 97 um so We've alluded to Dean Oliver a couple of times and his book and a lot of our modern discussion and understanding and a lot of, of folks who have um, made a living, as you have in this space, uh, in the, the basketball analytics space, everybody kind of draws from what Dean Oliver first established. So he came up with something called the four factors. Um, and it is there's there's four factors on offense. It's actually eight because there's four yeah. on offense, four on defense. but it's four factors. It's shooting, turnovers, rebounding, and free throws. But there's a specific way of measuring each of those. The shooting is measured through effective field goal percentage, which uh, combines two and three-point shooting or factors in the extra point for three-point shooting. The turnovers part is turnover percentage, so turnovers per 100 possessions. The rebounding is uh, offensive rebound percentage, if, if I recall that correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, and the free throws are free throws per field goal attempt. So the, those are the four factors, shooting turnovers, rebounding free throws. Those are the stats that I mentioned. Can you explain to folks why those are the four factors? Why, like there's a lot of different terms and ways to categorize the game and measure the game. Why did Dean Oliver settle on those four? And then even within those four, you could you could define shooting a bunch of different ways, but he went with effective field goal percentage. You could uh, re, you know turnovers to be defined a bunch of different ways, but he did turnovers per one hundred. Take us through those four and explain why that is. These are the building blocks for the way that we now analyze the game. Yeah, I think you know it's just kind of the the next layer of the analysis is how I think about it. So when I'm trying to understand why is the team successful or unsuccessful, well, the first thing you're going to want to look at is you know, how good are they overall, their net rating? Then you kind of go down from there to their offensive and defensive ratings, those two components of it. And then what are the components of those? And I think the next layer of that is, you know, those are kind of what, what I think made the four factors so successful is those are concepts that are familiar to every basketball coach. They talk about offense and defense in terms of, you know, shooting or preventing shooting, in terms of rebounding, in terms of forcing or avoiding turnovers, and in terms of getting to the free throw line or stopping your opponents from getting there. So, like, these are completely intuitive concepts, but you know, the four factors give you a way to quantify them and to do it all on a rate-based uh, way, even if they're not 
technically delineated per possession, you know, still the using field goal attempts for the denominator and the, the free throw rate more or less accomplishes that. And effective field goal percentage is, you know, just going to be kind of a measure of how many points you're creating for each shot attempt you're taking from the field. So when these concepts come into play, when this book is written and uh, eventually I'm sure basketball coaches are, are, are picking this up and, and people who are maybe, you know, more familiar with just the, the layman's version of the game, or if they're coaches, they might be version, you know, very familiar with the game at a very granular level, but you're still putting this in newer terms. Um, did, did the basketball community immediately embrace these things? Do you think they fully embrace it now, like it, it, or does every NBA coach familiar with the four factors, if you ask them what it was, would they be able to repeat that back to you that it's, it's not just these four things, but it's it's this me- this way we measure these four things? That's a good question. I, I don't know if every coach would. And I, I think every team sort of has different ways that they handle their reports now. And, you know, that's one of the big differences from. So when Dean published this book, I believe that was the fall of 2003. It was, you know, right before he started as a full time statistical consultant for the Sonics. I was lucky to kind of be on the ground floor being here in Seattle and and working at that point for the Sonics organization, uh, writing for the website. and. You know, so the concept of like each team has our own reports that we're having after each game and has our own analysis team like that seemed, you know, an impossible dream in 2003, but, you know, is now the practical reality of it. But, but that also, I think now means there's probably a little bit of individualization that, you know, it's kind of customized what coaches want on their post-game report. So it may not be the four factors specifically, but it's probably going to be pretty similar. I ask that because I think there is still sometimes people view this false binary of you are either in like the numbers camp, the analytics camp, the nerd camp, uh, or you are in the eye test camp, the the traditionalist camp. And it's not really the case. And I think especially as uh, you know, the league gets younger, both players and coaches, everybody, I think, and even plenty of, 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 of older basketball minds in this league, I think understand um, why these statistics or why, or how they um, how they inform their roster building, their play calling, everything else. So I don't think there's as so much of a divide as there is maybe in what what it would appear to be by the social media space or some of the some of the dumber discussions that we sometimes still have. But I ask about how the coaches embrace it only because I, it, I'm, I'm curious whether there even in, in the time that you've been doing this kevin and, and as you note starting um working around the, the sonics way back when um is there kind of an understanding even we even if this specific specific coach doesn't use the four factors specifically or these exact stats that b- the smart basketball people acknowledge and understand and use some version of this in a way that maybe fans don't realize that the it's all baked in now this is analytics isn't a separate thing yeah i mean again every team has their own department i i think every team at this point has multiple people working on this so you know it, you'd have to be actively going out of your way to to not be aware of what's going on if you're involved in the league from that standpoint fun story by the way on the involvement of coaches so what we now call effective field goal percentage which is basically you take field goal percentage and ha- add an extra half field goal for every three pointer because they're worth three instead of two that actually was originated by Mike Dunleavy Sr., the longtime NBA head coach. He called it true shooting percentage, which we've now adapted for a a different measure of scoring efficiency. But that was kind of like the first advanced statistic. I'm going to use this in super air quotes other than like looking at per 48 minutes uh, stats on my basketball cards that I was aware of because uh, it was used in, you know, kind of through Mike Dunleavy's influence in the Rick Barry pro basketball Bible series. And I had one of those uh, as a kid that uh, uh, appropriately I read pretty religiously. And so that was, you know, kind of a, a key, key point on my path in my statistics journey. But again, it came like the possessions with Dean Smith. It came from a coach in the league. And, you know, so there's similar goals here. The other thing I often think about is, look, unless you're at like an amateur basketball game where they literally don't, you know, publish the scores of any of the players, like we're influenced by stats all the time. The eye test people, first off, 
it, one of the things you find over time when you talk to people about the eye test, it's pretty strongly correlated with points per game, which is a statistic, as it turns out. Everyone cites statistics. The point of, you know, kind of the, the statistical movement in basketball, I think, is just to make those as independent of context as possible and as closely measuring what they're supposed to be measuring as possible because you know points per game is very valuable, but it's not necessarily the best measure of a score because it's easier to get more points per game by shooting a lot than by scoring efficiently. So let me get a little bit into some of these stats that are within the four factors. Um, shooting is measured by effective field goal percentage, which as you note, is weighted to give the extra uh, weight to the three-pointer. Um, for the longest time, if you were following basketball, you knew that a good field goal percentage was probably, uh, whatever, 45, 47% straight field goal percentage, right? And if somebody shot 50%, that was fantastic in a given game or for the season, 50% was, was outstanding. And, and a good three point percentage was maybe more like 35 or something, or that was maybe the lowest, but there, I, I think, you know, going way back, I think that was what I learned as, as these kind of measures: 35% threes, 45% overall, but the 45% overall took into account those threes. And you know that if we now know, we should have known all the time, the whole time, that you can shoot a lower percentage of three-pointers on the three-pointers, um, and it's going to be worth as much or more than a certain percentage of two-pointers. So effective field goal percentage accounts for that. Basic question, how do people know what a good effective field goal percentage is if, if they were it, had it instilled in them that, well, a good field goal percentage is about like, I don't know, 45 or something. Um, what's a good effective field goal percentage? Yeah, so it's going to be a little bit higher, but not maybe dramatically. So, you know, I think in the, you know, the the 53, 54, 55 percent range. And I mean, one of the aspects of this is, you know, we also get instilled in these things like, you know, I, I think in your case and mine, based on the 90s and early 2000s basketball yeah. and the measure of what's good has changed pretty dramatically in the last 10 years or years, the league has gotten more effective, uh, more efficient. Uh, to go back to your point on field goal percentage, though, one of my favorite thoughts here is that field goal percentage is the original advanced stat because look at it. It's a rate based stat. It doesn't involve, you know, volume like per game stats or totals. Uh, originally, it was the measure of scoring efficiency from the field because all shots were twos. The problem was just they added the three point line and all of a sudden, you know, threw off the scale pretty considerably. But for a large percentage of basketball history, your field goal percentage was your effective field goal percentage because there were no threes. So I, I think people think of field goal percentage as a traditional stat when actually in some ways it's more akin to some of these advanced stats. I have argued, and I am the layman in this conversation, right? You are the uh, advanced stats expert. I am I am just the ink-stained wretch who worked in newspapers for a long time covering the game, and I'm coming at this much more from the layman's standpoint. But I have come to the conclusion in my, my time doing this that straight-up field goal percentage should just be uh, thrown in the shredder entirely. It now frustrates me if I don't see a breakdown of the two point versus the three point percentage at a minimum effective field goal percentage is obviously a nice combination of the two. But every time I see what somebody's percentages or a team's percentages, I want to know what it was from two versus three, because those are very different things. And of course, even within two point percentage, you know, you, you could be great in the, in the paint or from six feet and you terrible from 16 feet, or you might be great. For, so a lot of it, and, and fortunately we have, you know, we have those zone graphics and everything else too, to inform us, why are we still using field goal percentage at all? Shouldn't we throw it out in favor of either always using two points and three point percentages separately, or if we want to combine it, use effective field goal percentage or true shooting percentage, which we haven't talked about too much yet, but true shooting percentage, of course, then accounts for free throws as well. So it gives you all scoring aspects in one all in one percentage. Um, why are we using field goal percentage at all anymore? Well, tradition is a powerful drug. So, you know, I think making that change is hard. One of the interesting things is, you know, when you look at stats uh, from outside the U.S., like all of the FIBA competitions and things like that, they almost always break it down into two-point percentage and three-point percentage and have for like dating back to the early 2000s when I started looking at them. So it's interesting that the convention is different there where three-point rates, I think, you know, the adoption was a little faster because the FIBA three-point line was so much shorter back then than the NBA three-point line. It, it kind of took a while, a while longer for that concept to catch on and it had to be part of analytics, so to speak. 
I'm curious um, to the, if, if you know this, because it's it's uh, it's Dean Oliver's four factors and not yours, but mm-hmm. uh, you are obviously very learned in this. Why did he choose effective field goal percentage as opposed to true shooting percentage? And, and give the listeners a sense of of how the the formulas differ there. Again, effective field goal percentage involves twos and threes. True shooting involves twos, threes and free throws. Yeah. So true shooting percentage, the concept is basically all of your shot attempts to try to score how many possessions did you use on those? And so there's a multiplier on the free throw attempts. Uh, You multiply them by 0.44 in kind of the traditional formula, although now you can just use, you know, how many times did a player shoot two free throws and or three free throws and then factor out the end ones. Uh, But that's why we have that multiplier because not all free throws are shot in sets of two and and translate into one possession. The reason Dean did that is because, again, he wanted to have getting to the free throw line is kind Kind of a separate concept from shot making and you know it's it's basically like a, a tomato tomato situation how you want to kind of parse out the different skills with an individual like so much of what we're talking about is their overall efficiency as a score i think it makes more sense for players to use true shooting percentage whereas for a team i do think we often talk about the ability to get to free throw line separately from shot making and that's why those are kind of divided out all right, so for on an let's let's keep it to an individual basis. You mentioned that effective field goal percentage, a good effective field goal percentage is what do you say, like 53, 54, or something like something along those lines. Uh, and what is a good baseline for what a good true shooting percentage is? Yeah, so this is one that, like I said earlier, has changed dramatically because when we you know started looking at true shooting percentage, you know I'd say around five thirty was maybe the average and and it should be noted that you know I don't think we explicitly said that like the reason that the formulas for effective field goal percentage and true shooting percentage look the way they do is to try to keep it on that same scale as field goal percentage because of the fact that people kind of intuitively understand that more than points per shot, which is what John Hollinger originally used in his work. Instead of true shooting percentage, he used it the same thing, but multiplied by two and called it uh, points per shot attempted, I think was the term that he used in, in his pro basketball prospectus slash forecast mm. book series. Uh, but so like I said, it was about a 530 true shooting percentage was league average, let's say 20 years ago. Now it's like over 570. So suddenly it's become a much higher bar to be an efficient score. Yeah. Uh, let's move into some of the other four factors. Um, turnover percentage, I guess, is sort of self-explanatory, but what else can you tell us about that as one of the factors of the four factors? Well, I guess the other thing we haven't delved into is kind of the relative importance of the four factors, because that's something that Dean yeah. looked into and wrote about. And it's evolved a little over time. But, you know, especially at the NBA level, what you find is like shot making is far and away the most important factor in who wins a game. And now we can kind of split that out into shot making versus the actual quality of the shots you get. That's one of the fun things we can do now. Uh, but, you know, that's, I think, historically about like half of your success is determined by your effective field goal percentage and your opponent's effective field goal percentage. And then the other half is split between the three other three factors. And, uh, you know, I, those tend to be more similar and, and vary a little bit over time, but turnovers, you know, are important, certainly in terms of the standpoint of just having that shot number of shot advantage over your opponent. Um, you mentioned this, and I'll, I'll I'll note it because there is a page on Basketball Reference that explains the four factors. And if people want to go and and read just kind of the brief summary of this, you can go to basketball-reference.com backslash about backslash factors dot html, um, and there is kind of a primer there. And it says that Dean Oliver listed the weight of the four factors. If you were, I guess, com- um, assessing importance of each of these, that shooting was forty percent. Uh, turnovers, 25%, rebounding, 20%, and free throws, 15%. Uh, sounds like you're saying it, it's actually those those weights maybe have adjusted a little bit over time, or maybe we have a little bit different... Um, uh, either, that, you know, either that I'm misremembering off the top of my head. I'd, I'd probably trust Dean. Or basketball my references, memory. you know, uh, summary could be a little bit off. But I thought that was interesting. That shooting is... And, and, and I guess, intuitively, right? Shooting, of course, should be the most important of all of these factors. Um, and then some combination of turnovers, rebounding, free throws. Um, but on rebounding, it's, it's specifically offensive rebounding rate. So explain what offensive rebounding rate is um, and why is that so important as a way to assess rebounding? Yeah, so I guess another like kind of big picture thing that I want to make sure I mention here is yeah. 
people will talk, uh, people use the term advanced stats. I haven't been able to come up with something better than that, even though I don't particularly like the term. And it makes it sound like, oh God, these are these super complicated formulas. And, and look, in terms of like the player value ratings that are out there, a lot of them are quite complicated or if you're doing adjusted plus minus. But offensive rebounding percentage is not any more difficult math than rebounds per game. It's just, the question is, what's the right thing to divide by? Like so much of statistical analysis in sports is what's the right thing to divide by? And instead of being a game, the answer is, well, how many missed shots were there by your team while you were out there? And so we find that by the total of offensive rebounds for or uh, offensive rebounds for your team and defensive rebounds for the other team. And, you know, the percentage that you get of that is what determines things. So that's a much better measure. You often hear people talk about rebounding differential is a, is a stat at the game level. Like, you know, Miami out rebounded Boston by 15 in this one. And the interesting thing about that stat is it, it actually is like strongly correlated with the success of your team, but it's one of those things where there's kind of a separate intermediary step. And the reason is, Teams grab way more, uh, way higher percentage of rebounds on defense than offense. So if you get more rebounds in a game, it probably means the other team missed shot more shots, and that's why you were successful. The other team mm-hmm. missing shots, not the rebounding per se. Huh. But to the extent that it is important, and again, one of the four factors is specifically offensive rebound rate. Offensive rebounds, when we're counting rebounds, when we're even when we're making them as a percentage, however we're assessing them. It's the offensive rebounds that seem to be very influential uh, in in this in this uh, assessment. Well, I mean, at the at the team level, kind of by definition, they're equally valuable since every defensive rebound present prevents an offensive rebound. But if you're looking at individual players, offensive rebounding is much more important because you know one of the things, especially over time. Uh, one of the strategic shifts that we've seen in the league, like dating back even to before the statistical analysis era, is uh, offensive rebounding rates being on the decline for a long period of time because coaches prioritize getting back on defense and presenting, yeah. preventing transition opportunities. So now you have, you know, a lot of defensive rebounds are basically like, who's going to take this? It's, you know, discretionary between a couple of players as opposed to like actually contesting for it. So if you add a great defensive rebound to your team, he's probably not going to increase your defensive rebounding rate that much. Whereas if you add an offensive rebounder, there's not that same kind of, uh, you know, competing for opportunities element. So if I'm uh, a GM looking to uh, fix my rebounding with, by one free agent signing, I should be looking for the the really good offensive rebounder, not the guy with the potentially inflated defensive rebounding stats because he's just the tallest guy who happens to grab all the misses from the other team. Or sometimes in Russell Westbrook's case, the shortest guy who happens to grab all the misses <laughs> from the other team. Not to pick on another player, but I suspected back in the day when suddenly Chris Humphreys became this rebounding machine that maybe a lot of that were, were kind of more the fluff rebounds that he just was on some bad teams that, that he was able to grab a lot of them. Or, oh, I'm, I'm going to be wrong. You're shaking a finger. You're not going to be wrong, but uh, this is like, this is, you know, getting, getting too deep into it. But one of the things at the player level is like, now I'm paid less attention to your player, a player's rebound percentage, because one of the things that we've been able to track better is the importance of box outs and how mm. players can affect their team rebounding, even without grabbing the rebound themselves. And you know who two of like the greatest uh, rebounding non rebounders are mm. one of them. Chris Humphreys played with is. Oh, uh, Brooke Lopez. Yeah. It's the Lopez twins are yeah. amazing at boxing out there. Uh, I think JJ Hickson might have played with with uh, Robin in Portland and was just like getting double doubles every game. And it's not because JJ Hickson's actually an amazing rebounder. It's because Robin Lopez was boxing out the other biggest guy on the court and Hickson could go and get the ball off the glass. And yet, especially early in Brooke Lopez's career and probably in Robin's too, these were guys who here they were these big beefy seven footers who were criticized mm-hmm. by their coaches. I can remember Avery mm-hmm. Johnson talking about Brooke Lopez at that size, he got to get more than seven rebounds a game or 6.5 rebounds, whatever he was getting at the time. And in Avery Johnson's defense, at that time, we didn't have all the tracking cameras installed in NBA arenas and we could not track box outs. Now, I'm sure that some coaching staffs, you tell me, probably were tracking things like that and probably did know the difference between a guy who got 10 rebounds a game in the J.J. Hickson manner, but who wasn't a great rebounder, but simply was benefiting from someone else boxing out. And the value of a Lopez twin who, in fact, enables 
all these rebounds to be gotten by your team, whether it was by them, them you know, the Lopez himself or by another teammate or not. We are, I would assume we are now smarter and teams are smarter about then how to ascribe value and in fact, then salaries to players who happen to be hit double digit rebounds versus maybe seven rebounds a game, but also enable your team to get more rebounds. Yeah, I mean, I I alluded earlier to like Roy Williams hand tracking possessions. Like that's how so much of the stuff was done by coaching staffs for decades over the year. Plus minus, you know, is a concept that's been in the league. I remember George Carl talking about it with the 90s Sonics and because of the fact that they had an assistant coach like sitting there keeping track of the plus minus by hand, box outs, deflections. And one of the big things that the camera tracking has done is basically like taken that that job out of the hands of assistant coaches and allowed us to do it much more quickly and easily. And I want to just uh, just to tie a bow on this particular part of the discussion for people who are listening and they have always kind of wondered or or still puzzle over the the value of what you uh, I know hate hearing the the advanced stats or analytics like oh none of the terms are great but if the stats the old stats did not actually help us distinguish between the guy who got double digit rebounds and was maybe not that valuable versus the guy who got fewer but was actually more valuable then maybe those old stats weren't really all that valuable to begin with and maybe even now especially now because we have better ways to assess this just because a guy gets double digit rebounds doesn't mean he's a quote unquote great rebounder or possibly more valuable to your team. That's the lesson here. The numbers didn't always tell us the truth, even if they were more understandable on some level because they involved less math. Exactly. The statistical analysis isn't necessarily about like whether to use numbers or not. It's about trying to get us to numbers that better measure what we want to measure. The last of the four factors, uh, free throws per field goal attempt. So as a measure of the importance of an influence of free throws, why, why free throws per field goal attempt? Yeah, I'm not totally sure why Dean chose that, except that, you know, kind of there is a bit of a relationship between, you know, if you have a turnover, by definition, you're not getting to the free throw line on that on that possession either way. So you've kind of already accounted for that part of it. But uh, yeah, it also just kind of makes it a, a more an easier to calculate number, I guess I would say, as opposed to having the possession stat, like, because a lot of what I think Dean was thinking of when he came up with the four factors is like, you know, coaches at every huddle or getting the the box score, the stat sheet, and, you know, kind of making this easy for them to calculate on the fly. And, and I think that was maybe a little easier to calculate than free throw attempts as a percentage of all of your possessions or plays. Well, I guess more to the point, why are free throws so important? Why are free, why are we measuring free throws as one of the four most influential things? Well, it turns out that they're the uh, the most efficient way to score. Like everyone can talk as much as they want about corner threes. And uh, obviously like a dunk is still the most valuable way to score. But outside of that, getting to the free throw line is great because, you know, terrible free throw percent shooters are those who shoot the same kind of percentage that you talked about earlier seemed like a great field goal percentage if you were over 50%. But if you shoot that from the line, even though it's the same number of points, uh, everyone thinks you're terrible, which relatively <laughs> to the skill you are. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. So as, as we uh, move on from this, let's talk about some of the sort of kind of a, a, a broader concepts here and, and or just the way we talk about the game. Scoring efficiency. Efficiency wasn't even a word I don't remember us using very often when I first started covering the NBA in the late 90s and early 2000s. If we did, again, all we had was field goal percentage, straight field goal percentage. Um, and I think everybody can agree that that efficiency matters, right? Like it's better to score 30 points on 15 field goal attempts than 30 points on 30 attempts, right? Everybody intuitively knows that. You don't have to do a lot of math. You don't need any fancy numbers. Um, so there's a Bunch of different ways, though, to define efficiency. Um, we have, as we mentioned earlier, effective field goal percentage. We have true shooting percentage. Um, there's points per possession, and and obviously the, all the other different versions of that points per per 100, which are all the same basic building block. Um, but what's what's the best way to define efficiency? If I want to say, listen, there, here's five 30 point scores this season, and I want to re rank them based on who did the best job of getting those 30 points with the fewest attempts, fewest possessions, fewest, whatever it may be. What's the best way of defining who was the most efficient of the 30 point scorers? Yeah. I don't think that 
it's necessarily the one of those ways is worse than the others. It's sort of kind of, you know, one of the concepts that Bill James talked about in baseball was stats having the power of language and true shooting percentage in terms of scoring has really gotten the power of language. One of the reasons that I like it over points per possession in that context is, you know, turnovers can be a product of your attempts to score, but they also can be in a product of your attempt to play mix. So if you're someone who is a real pass first distributor, not that like I'm struggling to come up with who the example would be today because we don't really have those types of players anymore. I guess maybe Ricky the Andre Rubio. Millers. Yeah, Ricky Rubio of recent vintage. Yeah. Uh you Jason know, those, Kidd. Muggsy Bogues back in the day, like those players are going to look inefficient because they're coming generating a lot of turnovers in the process of making plays for their teammates rather than trying to score themselves per se. So, you know, if we're just looking at the points side of it on the positive side of the ledger and not assists, I like to stick to true shooting percentage. And this is kind of one of those things where I think the understanding really evolved over time with statistical analysis because I think in the first wave of it, a lot of people would just look at it and say, well, whoever scores the most efficiently is the best score. So at that point, it was like Steve Kerr uh, in his late Chicago era, his San Antonio era, Fred Hoiberg, uh, long before he was head coach of the Chicago Bulls or in college, was a uh, super high efficiency volume spot up shooter. But one of the reasons these players are so efficient, and DeAndre Jordan would be another like modern example of that. Clint Capella, these guys who are strictly you know finishers on the pick and roll, have now become the most efficient players typically rather than spot up shooters. But they're doing that because of the fact that they're so, so selective in their attempts. And it's not really fair to compare them to a player who is creating a lot of his own offense, uh, you know, a, a lead score. And so that to me is like one of the most important relationships in basketball is kind of the trade-off between your scoring efficiency and the amount of offense you're creating, which we typically measure by usage rate, which is the percentage of your teams. You know, in this case, we do include turnovers, field goals, trips to the free throw line or turnovers, what percentage of those are you finishing while you're on the court? And what you find is there does seem to be a pretty consistent trade-off, like an average trade-off that you can use to measure this. But part of the reason that the high scores are ha- have such high usage rates is because their efficiency drops less when their usage goes up. Whereas, you know, if you all of a sudden were to take DeAndre Jordan or, you know, Clint Capella and force them to, you know, use 40% of their team's plays, their efficiency would drop off dramatically because there's only so many dunks you can get. (laughs) Yes. Um, And so that's, you know, it's important to note, like the traps you could fall into if you took things, uh, you you started defining things too rigidly or Mm -hmm. simplistically, right? Just because DeAndre Jordan is, quote unquote, more efficient by some measure doesn't mean give him all of the possessions, give him all the attempts. But it's an interesting way to then, uh, just to, to kind of uh, wrap up this part of the discussion, it's an interesting way of, of, of uh, bringing in, say, the volume score, right? Especially in uh, what our friend Seth Partnow refers to as this helio- heliocentric era, where you have this these heliocentric players who do everything, right? Usage rates are at all-time highs. The James Harden model, the Russell Westbrook model, Luka, Giannis, they're using more possessions as a, as a percentage of their team's possessions than anybody in any prior era, basically. Michael Jordan never saw the kind of regular season usage rates that some of these players do today. And, you know, maybe if we knew everything then that we know now, who knows? Maybe Phil Jackson would have just said, you know what? Screw the triangle. Michael, <laughs> <laughs> take shoot, you know, 45, 50% of possessions, whatever, t- you put the use, usage rate wasn't even a term back then, but he would have gone through the roof, perhaps. I, I guess um, Doug Collins was closer to that, that model. Yes, the, the, the Doug Collins version of Michael Jordan pre Phil Jackson was probably closer to that model. And, and Phil decided we need to rein it in and, and have more of a team concept. I myself aesthetically am more partial to that, but that's a debate for another day. I would just, without going too far down the rabbit hole, ask you this question though, Kevin. Russell Westbrook, um, if you ranked all the, the the scores of the last decade who averaged whatever, 28 or more per game, wherever his career average is now, or if we ranked all of the MVPs of all time and then used basketball reference or their stat head tool and then resorted based on effective field goal percentage or true shooting percentage, Westbrook falls way down to the bottom of that list. Derek Rose falls way to the bottom of that list. Um is that is that a fair thing when we were just discussing how you could be super efficient 
in the Steve Kerr manner where you're just a catch and shoot threes guy or in the DeAndre Jordan, Clint Capella manner where you are just a finisher at the rim and that's all you do. I'm not saying we would ever compare those two things. Those are, those are almost extremes. But when we were uh, assessing all of the guys who are high usage guys or who are the offensive engines of their team, fair to click that drop down or that, that, that sorting column and say, huh, interesting. Russell Westbrook, Derek Rose, these guys among all the MVPs have the worst efficiency based on, on those measures than their peers in that group. Um, how do you feel about using the, uh, the, the discussion in those terms in that manner? Yeah, I mean, I think once I would want to bracket it by usage rates rather than maybe kind of overall player inability because, you know, part of what is making these other MVPs get to that level, even though they have lower usage rates than, you know, the, the Westbrooks and the Roses is that they were so efficient with their opportunities. So, you know, I think there's that they kind of showed the trade off a little bit. But yeah, even once you go about go through that, like, 35 plus percent usage tier, then Westbrook is probably still going to be below James Harden in recent years, for example, or Doncic. So that, yeah. that comparison, I think is fair, especially, you know, if you're, you're one of the great stats that basketball reference has added in recent years is uh, adjusted shooting. So it's adjusted relative to league average. So like I talked about the fact that, you know, true shooting has gotten so much higher around the league. You can account for that at a glance by looking at the adjusted true shooting percentage relative to league average. Yeah. Um, as we wind down here, I want to kind of uh, uh, go off on a, a slight tangent here because it's something that you and I discussed uh, previously. And I think the, the audience would benefit from this measuring team strength. Um, we have the most basic stat in the world for this uh, wins and losses <laughs> <laughs> teams with more wins generally better than the teams with with fewer wins. Um and then there's this old Bill Parcells adage, which I have been mocking uh, this this past season, where he says, you are what your record says you are. And I keep saying, not true, not for this NBA season anyway, where we saw a six, seven and eight seed all advance out of the first round for the first time ever. Their records did not reflect. Those weren't just upsets. Their records did not reflect who they truly were. Now, there were different reasons for that. Some made big trades. Some got healthy. Um, in the Miami Heat's case, they, they just for some reason uh, are, you know, have a, this Jekyll and Hyde complex where they become a different team in the postseason. And yes, they did have a lot of injuries, too. But um, I've often heard uh, analytics experts say that win-loss isn't the most necessarily the most indi- uh, or best indicator of team strength anyway, that point differential for NBA teams is actually a better measure. I've even seen references to things like, well, Team X is a game under 500, but their point differential suggests they actually should be a 45 win team. Explain that for us. Yeah. And I think this is, again, a concept that's intuitively familiar to people. We're more impressed by a 30 point victory than we are a one point victory. And likewise, a, you know, a 30 point loss is worse than a one point loss. But in the standings, they all count the same. And, and that's important, obviously, because that's what's going to determine seeding. But if we're trying to understand how team good a team is going forward, we want to understand that dominance and factor that in as well. So that's why point differential, you know, it's not a dramatic difference, but it does tend to be slightly more predictive going forward from one year to the next, or, or even in many cases in the playoffs, than your overall win loss record is. And, you know, that to me often is, is one of the measures I use is, you know, to try to, you can't do this with everything, but to try to understand how meaningful something is, how good is it at predicting what's going to happen in the future? And you can find that on average, there's a very consistent relationship between teams point differential and their win percentage. It breaks down a little bit at the extremes uh, just because of the fact that, you know, uh, a, a plus 14 differential versus a plus 13 no longer means as much as a plus two versus a plus one, let's say. But, you know, the differences between those in terms of winning or losing close games, which is something that Miami has managed to specialize in all throughout this season on into the playoffs. And then also just kind of the, the, whether you win, uh, how often you win via blowout and lose via blowout. Those do tend to tell you something about a team, uh, you know, above and beyond what you can learn from simply whether they won or lost the game. And you can measure that either by point differential or net rating. Uh, it, they're, they're closely enough linked that it really doesn't matter as long as you're using the same one. 
So this is smashing another old adage, right? Which is that, oh, a win is a win. Doesn't matter if you won by, or it's usually by the losing part, right? Doesn't matter if we lost by one or lost by 50. It actually seemingly does matter for uh, implications for how good you actually are and what your future success might be. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, look, in ter- again, in terms of the standings, in terms of the goal of winning or losing the game, you know, the, the result is the same, but often a lot of what we're doing uh, when you're looking at things from a predictive standpoint is what was the process rather than just the result. And the point differential tells us more about the process than whether you won or lost. So this is a nice, smart thing that fans can can do when you're debating at uh, the bar or the water cooler. Are there water coolers anymore? I don't even know. Do people have offices anymore? I don't know. There may be a water cooler. But if you're debating somebody there, you can go because even on, you know, say ESPN, um, the ESPN.com standings, and I think pretty much all of them universally now, you can do, you know, you've got the wins and the losses and the winning percentage. But there's usually a column now for point differential. And if you reorder by by point differential, you'll sometimes see a team that was lingering in 10th jumps up to 7th because they've got a better point differential than several teams ahead of them, which, as you're, you're telling us, Kevin, suggests that that team is probably better than what their record suggests and may actually be the team that could become a, a Miami Heat type where they're, they're going to, to, to pull all of these seeming upsets. Yes, although uh, past performance is not always indicative of future <laughs> results, which is why the Cleveland yes. Cavaliers are not the team that has made the miracle finals run in the Eastern Ex- Conference explain, this year. Yeah, explain had, that one. They yeah. had, I believe, the second best point differential in the league this year after the Celtics, but uh, you know, dramatically outperformed their their point differential, but that did not carry over in the playoffs. So, okay, so explain that. Let's go to the next level. There, explain that. So, if 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 it if it tends to be indicative of something else, if the point differential tends to be indicative of something beyond the win-loss, um, but in some cases, it, it does not translate. What do you conclude from that? I mean, number one, like, you know, this is over a large sample. Like we're talking about across all teams in NBA history, the point differential is more predictive. The For any individual team, you know, it may not hold just as the favorite sure. in the series doesn't always win. But, you know, I think it, it, it is, like Miami's success is interesting and probably worthy of some more exploration because this is a team that has been very good in the clutch for a period of time now, which is why you know they they outperformed their point differential in terms of their record pretty substantially. They're the first team with a negative point differential to get to the finals uh, since 1959, only the second ever. So it, it is kind of fascinating in that regard. But uh, to to your Bill Parcells point, look, Bill Parcells has never had to coach against playoff Jimmy. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't know what Bill Parcells would have done with playoff <laughs> Jimmy. And uh, and I suspect we will we will also be studying the Miami Heat and their very unique um brand of success or their unique path to success we will probably be discussing for many years to come. Uh before we wind up, before I let you go, anything uh that uh you would recommend for the listeners specific tools, reference points, anything else where if you're, if they're trying to kind of get their feet wet and trying to grasp this, um, you know, maybe making their, their concerted effort for the first time, where else would you steer them? Yeah. I mean, I think basketball on paper still has a lot of relevance for the reasons that we talked about in terms of just kind of understanding how we got here in the history of things, even if inevitably a, a book that is now almost two decades old, some of the specific references are, are no longer going to be as fresh and as relevant uh, as they were back then. Obviously, you've talked about our buddy Seth Part now, and you know his book is a fantastic resource in terms of sort of under updating that for the modern era and you know all these uh, statistical developments that we could not anticipate back in 2003 that the camera tracking has you know enabled us to understand uh, I I also think sometimes just like playing around on basketballreference.com nba.com stats side uh, cleaning the glass you know that's Stat side is in part paywalled, but has a number of terrific resources. Uh, you know, I think now the challenge, you know, in 2003, the challenge was having things available. In 2023, now it's kind of sorting through all the different data that we have available. And sometimes maybe a little too much in terms of like being able to find the lineup stats for a lineup that played five minutes together and, and think that's meaningful. I feel like the challenge before was there wasn't enough and the challenge now is there's way too much to, exactly. to sum it up. But it's, it's frankly overload for, uh, for, for some of us, but we're drinking from a we, fire hose. Yes. Yes. Something like that. Uh, well, this has been uh, fantastic, Kevin. Um, as Kevin said, uh, 
go find Dean Oliver's Basketball on Paper is a great resource. Seth Partnow's book is a great uh, resource. And of course, Kevin Pelton's coverage of the NBA on ESPN.com is a phenomenal resource as well. So go check him out there. Kevin, thanks so much for spending the time with us. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Wow, great stuff from Kevin Pelton. Hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. If you want to learn more, I very much encourage you to go find a copy of Dean Oliver's book, Basketball on Paper, as well as Seth Partnow's book, The Midrange Theory. Both of those are great resources. And of course, you can follow all of Kevin Pelton's work at ESPN.com. He is on Twitter at K Pelton. I am also on Twitter at Howard Beck. Be sure to tune into this feed in the weeks ahead as other experts join me to explore different aspects of basketball analytics, including the way we use and perhaps misuse them in our daily debates about the NBA. But before we go, a small request for all our listeners. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to our show and leave us a rating and review. Your feedback and support mean the world to us and help us reach more passionate sports enthusiasts like yourself. Also, I want to encourage you to explore Sports Business Classroom and discover the incredible resources it has to offer. Whether you're looking to enhance your knowledge of the sports industry, develop your skills, or network with industry professionals, SBC is the ultimate destination. To learn more about SBC and its valuable programs, visit sportsbusinessclassroom.com. Thank you for being a part of our podcast community, and we appreciate your continued support. Together, let's keep chasing our dreams and making a lasting impact in the world of sports. Sports.